I just wanted to show a little video clip. It, actually, it's an easy way to get a round of applause, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it shows how wonderful and dramatic Arapahoe Basin is. My daughter happens to be the ski model, so I always enjoy watching her ski too. So, you know, uh, let me just ask you guys a few questions, just so I understand the group a little bit. Um, are, who, are all you guys skiers and snowboarders? Raise, yeah, yeah, okay. So are you guys familiar with A Basin? Do you, do you think of yourself as A Basin skiers? Okay. Are you familiar with our Beavers project? Okay, pretty good. For next year, are you guys, how many of you guys are planning on buying one of the Vail Resorts type Epic Passes? Okay, and how many of you guys are thinking about getting the Icon Pass? Okay. How many of you are just gonna buy an A Basin Pass? There's the really smart ones right there. <laughs> so I, I, I have this really cool job. It's, it's a fantastic job. It is really work. Um, you know, there are definitely tough days at the job. Um, we have 500 employees, you know, all the things associated with managing people. We have all that, that's tough. We have all these facilities we have to manage, all these lifts, all this equipment water plants, a sewer plant, all kinds of stuff. Sometimes it's really quite hard, but you know, overall, it's really a great job. And, and the more fun people have when they come to the base and just the better work is, everything just works better and better and better the more fun people have. So, you know, I often, I often get asked by people, uh, how did I get my job? Or, you know, they, they want my job. Tell me what to do to get my job. And it's, <laughs> To, uh, that's a hard thing, because I kind of got it through several strokes of luck, and I, I really encourage people to not point for one job, but to really put yourself on a path where you're doing the things you like, you get the satisfaction with your work you're looking for. It's not always going to be fun, but, but something that really is pleasing for you. And my predecessor held the job for about 20 years, I've had it for 13, I, hopefully I have it for 20, 25 by the time I'm done. So that means in one like 40, 45 year period, the job only opened once. So I, I try not to encourage people to just shoot for one point because it, it's not the best thing to do. But um, like Luke said, I, uh, uh, I grew up in Tucson. I was always really active, hiking, backpacking. You know, by the time I was in middle school, my parents were dropping my friends and I off at a trailhead. and picking us up a week later on the other side of the mountain range. So I've always been really out and doing things. I studied forestry at Northern Arizona University. That's where I really started skiing a lot. There's a great ski area outside of Flagstaff called Arizona Snowball. And uh, worked seasonally for the Forest Service. I had aspirations to be uh, a park service ranger. Really tough to get a job doing that at that stage of the game. Reagan was president. He was not kind to those talk louder. Okay, am I on? No, you're good. Okay. It's them? Okay. You know, but, but uh, through a, a couple of strokes of luck, I ended up moving to Summit County right after my last stint with the Forest Service in Escalante, Utah. And uh, I started working at Keystone, and like most of us in the ski business, I worked a ton of different jobs. I started as a busboy, I was a waiter, I taught some skiing, I worked for lift maintenance, I did a bunch of different food and beverage jobs. I worked at the golf course. I think my first five years there, I, I had about a dozen different jobs. And, um, and uh, including, I, I spent one summer down at Mount Hotham in Australia working as a ski patroller. And uh, you know Mount Hotham? I worked there. Oh, what'd you do? I was a lifty. Lifty, okay, got it, got it, got it. Great ski area, great ski area. You know, and, and Keystone and Arapaho were one company at that time. And, and after five years, I was a ski patrol supervisor at Keystone. And uh, the patrol director job opened up at Keystone. I thought for sure I was gonna get it. And I had a great interview and I knew everybody really well and I applied for the job and I didn't get it. And it, it really bummed me out. And, and by sheer luck, just a few weeks later, the A Basin ski patrol director job opened up. and. Uh, I didn't think I had a chance of hell of getting that job, but I, I'm like, I'm gonna apply for this anyway. And I, I uh, the guy who was the manager at the time, a guy named Jim, he and I had had a little tiff not too long before this. And I, I went up to talk to him about the job and he was kind of a jerk to me. And uh, um, 
thought about it for a few days. I went back up and talked to him. You know, I was like, if you don't want me to apply for this job, I won't. Just let me know. And he was really nice. And actually, then a couple days later, I interviewed for the job, and I got it. Total surprise. Because uh, uh, that was culturally, that was a big thing. I was one of the Keystone guys, and I got this great job at Arapahoe. And uh, uh, despite Jim and I having a rough start, um, after a couple of years, we became best of friends. And uh, 30 years later, we're still best of friends. And um, um, we go on raft trips and hut trips and all kinds of stuff. So a stroke of luck to get that job. And, it, and I was as into it as you could be into any job. You know, we had a, a group of patrollers that were a fantastic group that worked very well together. And, you know, if you recall, the 90s were, uh, you guys might not have been around then, but they were really big snow years. We had some exciting, fun uh, avalanche stuff, big snow, all kinds of stuff going on. And, and I loved it. And, uh, um, and you know, I, I still, for a long time, I thought I wouldn't be in Summit County that long, that it was just a stop along the way in the journey. And a few years after I got that job, I, I, I had been married and I had a couple kids by then. And uh, um, I just one day I kind of realized I really loved Summit County. I loved living there. I loved the base and I loved working there. It was a really, really good thing. And so at that point, I was kind of hooked. And then a few more years down the road, uh, there's some other things about the place that really started appealing to me. And I, you know, for a long time, it was just being a patroller and doing avalanche work and rescuing people and doing stuff like that. But, you know, when we would, uh, when we'd get a bunch of terrain open for, a, you know, following a big storm, you know, and, and, and we'd, we'd get things going, people would be so happy. And people were coming up to me all the time saying, oh, thank you so much. That was so cool you guys got that open for us today. We had the time of our lives. And that, that really started uh, connecting with me. I really enjoyed delivering that. And then about the same time, the, the business side of it started getting fun for me. And uh, I, I was the opposite of a business guy prior to that. But it, it really became a fun challenge you know, to realize, OK, if we do that, you know, 500 more people are going to show up. That's kind of cool. Let's let's do that a lot, and and uh, so that it was really fun, and I and I I, I really got into it, and um, um, and and things were rolling along, and 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 I finally got a, a a new job there. It was the director of mountain operations for a while, and then in 2005, uh, our our company bought into a ski area in California called Bear Valley, and um, my good friend Jim. He left to manage, go manage Bear Valley, so I got his job. So that's when I became the COO at A Basin, and it's it's been no turning back for me. I just loved it. It's been great fun, and, and it, it is such a good place to work. And we got a great team. I really, really enjoy it. I'm going to show a few slides from back in the beginning. So the guy in the center of the picture there, the tall gentleman, is Larry Jump, and he was Arapaho Basin's first president. And he, he's the, the brains behind the business. He was the driver of the whole business. And in 1946, he rounded up this group of five people. They were the original board of directors that signed the incorporating documents. And that's Max Durkham on the left, who years later became the visionary for Keystone. And Sandy Scheffler and, and Dick Durance on the right there. He was probably the biggest name in skiing in 1946 in the US and Thor Groswald. There used to be a ski company in Denver called Groswald Skis. And, and, and Larry was an amazing guy. Larry was a 1935 graduate at Dartmouth. He served with the French Army in World War II before the US was involved in the war. He was captured by the Germans. They released him. He came back, joined the 10th Mountain Division, served at Camp Hale, served at the campaign in Kiska and Alaska and over in Italy also. And he was this group of guys, you know, uh, there's a group of people that are really credited with developing a lot of skiing in the U.S. that were 10th Mountain guys. So he was one of the core guys in that group. And they, it was not easy for them. They struggled and scraped to come up with every penny, but they managed to get the ski area open in 46, 47 with one rope toe. And by the following year, they had uh, installed two single chairlifts, one just about where Black Mountain Express uh, is. And the other, this one's going to the summit right about where Norway is. 
So they, you know, credit those guys, they, they found it. They're the ones that said, we can make all this happen. Um, I, just for fun, I, I thought you guys might enjoy some old pictures of the old single chair there on the left compared to what it looks like today. And a view towards Polly before we had cut the uh, North Glade and Standard and Slalom Stadium trails. I love this one at the top of Black Mountain Express, the old car there camped out. Another great shot at the top of Polly Zone. So I'm going to skip like 45 years in the history here and, and, and go to 1997. So crazy time in skiing, crazy time for Arapahoe Basin. By then, Arapahoe Basin and Keystone and Breckenridge were one company. And we were owned by a corporation called Rawl Corp, which had been a spinoff of Ralston Purina. That company merged with Vail Associates, which was Vail and Beaver Creek. And uh, when the Department of Justice approved that merger, they forced the divestiture of a basin. And uh, so we got kicked out on our own. Nobody, didn't make sense to anybody, but it's what happened. And uh, so we were bought by a Canadian company at the time. The story uh, is told is if it's the smallest resort of the three to sell off. Ask me that afterwards. I'll, I'll go into more detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know a little bit more than that. That's semi-accurate. Uh, <laughs> Um, but we were bought by this company out of Toronto called Dundee Realty, now called Dream. And, and you know, Dream spent a few years uh, kind of figuring it out and understanding what's going on. But when we got spun off, there were seven year-round employees there. And, and we were really part of the Keystone Breckenridge machine. We had the people there to run the mountain. But we didn't have any accounting, we didn't have any marketing, we didn't have any human resources, we didn't have any of that backup stuff. So we had to, in 1997, we had to build our company. And I was the lieutenant there. Jim, my, my friend Jim was still the manager and I was the number two guy. And it was, it was so much fun to do that. You know, it was, it was just a very cool time. We had no idea what we were doing, but we, we didn't let anyone else know that. But, but, but uh, it was a very fun time. But once we kind of got settled, Dundee, now Dream, really started consistently investing in the place. And I'm not going to go through these things item by item, but every year we make a significant capital investment in the place. And, and it's really paid off. And, uh, um, you know, I, I never, if you would have asked me in 2001, would we have done all this stuff by now? I would have never said we would have. But, but it's good. And now the list just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And everything we do works. And so it's worth investing even more. And I'm really not doing a financial presentation and this stuff I don't normally share with people, but I just wanted to show you if you, if you go back to the 2000, 2001, you know, for the 20 years before that, our average was like, so it had been flat for 20 years. And when we started doing things, we we're just steadily doing better. And so, so all that stuff, has paid off. It's been a, it's been a very good deal for us. Um, the dips that you see, those are the big droughts that we've experienced over the last 20 years. Um, I love this old trail map. It's from the 60s. You know, if you look closely, which you don't need to, but it shows there were five Palma lifts. Larry Jump, in addition to being the president of A Basin, was the North American distributor for Palma lifts. So there was a lot of Palma lifts at A Basin. And, <laughs> um, but what is really important here is this is where I'm going to go into the beavers. This is from the 60s, and trail number 31 out here is uh, Beaver Run. And I've got trails from the trail maps from the 40s that show the beavers on there. And, and the beavers has always been an integral part of the ski area. You know, back in these days, ski area boundaries uh, were not what they are today. Things weren't as clear. The ski areas were still being developed. There was no Ski Safety Act then. But the Beavers has always been a part of it. And so, you know, we've been working on this, including the Beavers in the ski area, for a very long time. And um, it, it, it is a beautiful chunk of terrain. It's 468 acres. And what we're going to have, about 129 of it, is called the Steep Gullies. And they're these beautiful steep shoots. How many of you guys have skied in the steep gullies? A few of you, okay, good, good, good. And uh, just as 
exciting and intense and gnarly a double black diamond terrain you can find. And then the other 339, if my math's right there, you know, is, is uh, a bunch of beautiful glade skiing. There's some above timberline open bowl stuff. We're gonna have two conventional blue trails out there, um, but it's, it's, it's really some beautiful skiing. Um, so Luke had asked me to talk a little bit about some of how we work with our stakeholders, in particular through the Forest Service, because it is a big deal to get a project like this pushed through. And, you know, there's a lot of people that ski the basin. You know, I think if you look individually, it's probably almost a couple hundred thousand people. Um, and, you know, one of the problems that when you ask people what they think is that they tell you. And, uh, um, and so you get a lot of really different and conflicting information. And, um, you know, when we started on this process, you know, we did some stuff like 20 years ago that was kind of analogous to zoning that we worked on with the Forest Service. And their lingo, it's called land use prescriptions. But, you know, we, 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 we worked with them to get the right land use prescriptions for both Montezuma Bowl and the Beavers, which just enabled us to ask the question, can we, can we add this area? Um, and then, you know, we, worked, we spent several years kind of figuring out what to do because when you go out and ski it now, especially after the lift is in, it's going to seem like this makes perfect sense. But from a backcountry skier's perspective, it, it was totally out of the paradigm of thinking. And it really took us a long time to figure out how to do it. And what we all guessed was the logical way to propose this expansion. When we dove into the details, we just couldn't make it work. So we finally came up with this great idea we went through quite a master planning process. We had to do an environmental impact statement. But you know, the, the core and the heart and soul of that environmental impact statement is, is right at the beginning. And, and when you, and this is, we're all on federal land, when you do an action like this on federal land, you gotta go through NEPA, or the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, which requires you to do some kind of environmental review. In, in this particular case, it was an environmental impact statement. The core of that, right at the beginning, is you got, have to establish a purpose and need. So there has to be a good reason. And just to make a basin richer is not a good enough reason, okay? It's gotta have some good. Good for the community, good for the employees, good for the people that ski there. And, and we worked really hard on this. And, and there were some extraordinarily good reasons to do this, a couple of them in particular. One, the, the steep gullies in particular ha, has a really tragic history of avalanche accidents, avalanche fatalities. There's actually been half a dozen of them out there. And we, we said the public would be better served if this area was managed as part of a ski area avalanche mitigation plan. And, and, and I, I I firmly believe that is totally true. And, you know, because it's so easy to get to this area, and, and most of the people that got caught in these accidents had no clue. A friend dragged them along, something like that. So we, we, we thought that was important. And frankly, you know, when an accident happened, we had to go out and either rescue people or recover the people. It's terrible. And so, you know, that was another, that was a really good reason. The other reason was, you know, A-Basin's pretty close to Denver. We're close to DIA. We're surrounded by the best resorts in the world. You know, our current demand is significant, and the anticipated future demand is huge. I mean, uh, uh, I, I actually got here about an hour and a half early, and I just wandered around here for about an hour, and I, I just can't believe the way Denver's growing and, and how many uh, uh, I'm saying this complimentary. I mean, there's just so much energy. There's so much excitement down here. You guys are the embodiment of that. But there's people that want to get up in the mountains and enjoy it. And, you know, if, if we want to keep the quality at A Basin high, we're going to have to keep working on it. And we felt by adding another chunk of acreage, adding another lift, we could spread people out that much further. We could keep the quality that much higher. So we had those two things that were really, really a really strong purpose and need. There was some other little stuff that didn't really apply to the beavers, but. 
You know, as far as how we work through this process, you know, for one, whenever you have a project, it's got to be good. You know, if your project stinks, you know, it's hard to get it approved. So you really got to come up with a good plan, which I think we did. And we really got to know our project well. And uh, because we're, we're, I mean, we're literally dealing with hundreds of people through the process and everybody wants things a little bit differently. And uh, um, um, so we really had to know what, what was critical for our project. And we really had to know what wasn't. And, and we had a couple of things that were critical. It, it had to have a chairlift. And there were people that wanted us to do it without a chairlift, just make it all hiking all the time. And we had to have a couple of conventional trails, which only add up to 26 acres, but we had to have a couple conventional trails. So that was what we wanted to stick our guns to, but everything else was on the table. And uh, um, so that put us in a good position because we weren't asking for a huge amount. And the skiing out there is fantastic, so we're going to end up with all this great gladed skiing. That was very good. Additionally, on top of that, you really got to listen to all your stakeholders. And you got to communicate with them. You got to be transparent. You got to be very open. So I was doing my dog and pony show for a few years, going to the county commissioners going to the Snake River Planning Commission, going to all different levels of the Forest Service talking, doing open houses at the ski area, explaining it, doing it for the Summit Daily, doing it for whoever would want to talk. And, and uh, you know, it, that, that was just so important because not everybody wanted us to do it, although our support was pretty substantially overwhelming. But there were a few people that really didn't want us to do this. And, and we really had to listen to everybody. And one of the most important things that we heard came from the biologists that were going to be part of the approval process and that was we had to have as minimum an impact to wildlife as we could get away with primarily driven by lynx habitat we couldn't do too much of an impact to lynx habitat the biggest way we could do that was to cut the fewest trees we could get away with so you know i said Two trails were what was critical. We started with three. We got rid of one of them. We narrowed those trails down. Um, originally, like I, I was telling you about the original thoughts, the lift was going to go all the way to the valley bottom. For a bunch of reasons, that's not a good idea. One of them was it would have tripled the amount of trees we had to cut to go down there. And then in our glading, we, we scaled that back a whole bunch too. And so, you know, all these people that we were working with, um, um, saw that, saw we were open, we were able to work together and, you know, uh, you know, I, I would just blatantly ask when I was talking to the biologist from the Fish and Wildlife Service, like, what do you need? And we'll figure out how to do it. And so, so that, that's a, a, a really important thing. And, and in this kind of work, you really got to get your key stakeholders on board and one of the, the most valuable things we did was we worked really closely with our county government. In the end, our county commissioners wrote a letter of support for the project. They definitely had some things they were concerned about that they wanted us to do, and that's fair enough, but, but they wrote a letter of support. Our local sheriff, who had been involved in the rescues, also the sheriff in our, our community oversees search and rescue, he wrote a letter of support also. So that. That was really big. And although we had this group that in the end was pretty small, they were kind of noisy, but they were a pretty small group of people, we overwhelmingly got this thing through uh, without much opposition at all. And I, I think it was because of the way we went about it, talking and mostly listening to what people had to say. So, not sure how long I spoke there, but this is Beaver Bowl and uh, um, a bunch of those pictures uh, from the video were skiing Beaver Bowl, where she was skiing in the big open powder fields. I mean, it, it's fantastic out there. I think this is going to be a game changer for us, and, and the skiing is just so much fun. I think you guys are going to really, really enjoy it.